1 Corinthians 7 verse 14 says that a believing wife sanctifies her unbelieving husband and a believing husband sanctifies his unbelieving wife. Does the sanctification of these unbelievers mean they're saved by their believing spouses? Or does it have an altogether different meaning? Well, stay with us to find out. Listening to the question and answer program with our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. This is Steve Schwetz inviting you to join us for the next 30 minutes as we listen to the wit and wisdom that Dr. McGee provided in answering the questions of his listeners. Now, our first question comes to us from a listener in Los Angeles. It seems to me that any denial of personality to God is fatal to religion. John 4, verse 24 says that God is spirit and that we must worship him in spirit and truth. However, the Presbyterian Confession of Faith says that God is without body, parts, or passions, which, in my view, is atheism. The Bible represents God as a real person and holds him out as the monarch of the universe. What is your position on this issue? Now, I think that the whole problem of this individual, and when he says that it's tantamount to atheism of what the Presbyterian Confession of Faith says... God is without body parts or passions. May I say that as far as that statement is concerned, it's one of the finest and one of the most biblical ones that's made. I could only wish that the Presbyterian Church would get back to its own confession of faith and believe it and preach it today instead of some other gospel. So I want to say, first of all, that I concur in the language of that statement, and do not believe for one iota that it's tantamount to atheism. The difficulty with this party is this, and I trust we might be helpful at this particular point, is that you mistake a body for personality. You feel that there has to be that which is physical before any person can be a personality, and that that is essential. May I say to you that the whole point is that Scripture makes it clear that even this body that you and I have, though it's part of us, we certainly are identified by this body down here, we certainly are residents of it, but all the Scripture says about it is it's called a tabernacle, it's called a tent that we live in, that actually the real you is not the body. In other words, the body is not the personality at all. It's the way we move down here in this physical world, the way we express ourselves. And today there's still an argument raging in, among psychologists of whether the mind originates thought or whether the thought is just carried through these little axon and dendrites of the nervous system. In other words, that your brain and my brain doesn't originate thought any more than a telephone originates conversation. All it does is communicate it. Now, all of that is to say just simply this, that there is a personality and you and I are a personality without our body. In fact, the most important part of you and me has nothing to do that which is tangible. For instance, love. That's not something you see and hate and those great truths, those great facts, and yet they're not something you can put under a microscope. You can't pour them in a test tube. You couldn't put mother love in a test tube and go at it like that. You may get some reactions in the body, and for one person it'd be one thing and another person it'd be something else. So that actually this matter of the body, friends, is a very small part of us. One of these days, we'll move out of the body. 
And then we are to have the resurrection of the body. When our Lord comes, the believers are going to be translated and all of that. But the important part of us, let's remember, is not our body. The best that can be said is it's only one-third of us, body, mind, and spirit. Now God, who created all things physical, and the physical universe is separate from him, Actually, what this part is saying when he says that that statement in the confession of faith is tantamount to atheism, actually what he is is a pantheist. He believed God somehow or another occupies this universe, that he's part of the physical universe. Well, he's not. He's separate from it altogether. It's something that he created. He's apart from it, and yet it is a mechanism that is under his perfect control and one over which he exercises a tremendous and uh, moment-by-moment supervision in such a way that it couldn't exist for two minutes without his presence and without his power. But he is separate from it. And therefore, the one who made the eye, he can see, but he doesn't have an eye, as you and I have it. And the one who made the hand, he does what the hand can do, but he does not have a physical hand at all. And I say that you are tempted to reduce God to some pantheistic notion that at one time plunged the world into idolatry. And Scripture makes it very clear God is a spirit. And that is the opposite of that which is physical, my beloved. And for that reason, we must hold to the fact that God is a spirit and that he does manifest himself. He took upon himself our human flesh. Now, he could not have taken upon himself our humanity, our physical being, if he before was a physical being. But you see, he was not. And we must maintain that. Now, I realize very definitely that what I'm saying will not be satisfactory to this individual, but I've taken this time, a little extra time, to answer this question in order that it might be helpful to others. And then uh, let me say this final word, because so many of the cults and isms plunge in at this particular point, and it's just simply this. God is infinite. You and I are finite creatures, and it is absolutely impossible for a finite mind to comprehend an infinite God. And your lack of understanding and my lack of understanding and your ignorance and my ignorance is due to the fact that we are finite creatures and he is an infinite God. And because there are certain things that you can't solve, Uh, doesn't mean that there's not an answer to them. It just means that you and I happen to be finite creatures. The same listener has a second question for us. It's, why do we call the church building the house of God in light of what Paul said in Acts 7, verse 48, and Acts 17, verse 24? I do not think it's necessary to turn to these passages. However, I will turn to one of them that you've given, Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. May I say that in the Old Testament, it was also understood because Israel did not have a crude idea of God. When Solomon dedicated the temple, he said the heaven of heavens cannot contain the And how can this house that we have built? So you can see that it's obvious that the Old Testament saints, the instructed ones, the ones who knew the Old Testament, understood God did not dwell in a house. And yet, that was called the house of God, and they met him there. Now, when you come to the New Testament, now Paul gave this here to the Athenians who were worshiping idols, actually. But for believers today, We, I believe, are are on even a little higher plane than this. Now, God does not inhabit any house today, and the reason is not because of this passage in Acts, but because, rather, of what he said in the epistle to the Ephesians, and that is that God today is inhabiting believers, uh, not the building, if you please. 
And Paul says to the Ephesians in the second chapter, and I'll just lift out one or two verses, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit, so that the believer today is indwelt by the Spirit of God. And in that sense, Paul says, we are the temple. And you remember when he wrote to the Corinthians, he says, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. A listener in Rogers, Arkansas, asked this question. Could you explain the third heaven mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2? Well, the third heaven there, and we hasten to say, Scripture doesn't mention a seventh heaven. That happens to be in the nomenclature of man and not the Scripture. We have three different heavens that are mentioned to us in Scripture. We have, for instance, the Lord spoke of the birds of heaven. Now, that first heaven is the air spaces that surround this earth. And today we're hearing a great deal about that, that the atmosphere on this earth doesn't just penetrate out yonder forever, that it ends up not too far up, by the way. And the farther up you go, the less air you have. And that you reach a place where you're absolutely beyond the atmosphere of this earth. In fact, there's just no atmosphere up there. There's nothing. That's it, nothing that's up yonder. Only thing about nothing is, even when you got nothing, you got space between. It's distance. It takes up a lot of room, even if it's nothing. It occupies a lot of room up there. So that that first is called the birds of the heaven. That's the first heaven. The second heaven, our Lord again used it, the stars of heaven. And out yonder, beyond the air spaces, the atmosphere of this earth, where man lives and all created things down here that have lungs, when you move out beyond that, you come to the stars. And my, how in the world, back in Bible days, when they knew so little about astronomy, how did they know that tremendous distinction between the atmosphere of this earth and out beyond in the stellar spaces? And Scripture speaks of that. Now, that is the second heaven. Now, the third heaven that Paul refers to is evidently where the throne of God is, out yonder beyond the atmosphere of this earth and beyond all of the stellar spaces, and that seems infinite. In fact, that's an interesting statement I read the other night, that now astronomy believes that space is infinite. That is, there's no end to it. Well, it's created height and depth, no created thing, and includes height and depth, and that's space, and it's created. And if it's created, it's finite. It's got an end to it. Now, I don't know where it is, but believe me, it's got an end out yonder somewhere. So that space does have an end. Beyond that is the throne of God, the third heaven, and that's where Paul was caught up to. I believe that that's what he means here in 2 Corinthians 12, too. The same listener also asks for Dr. McGee's explanation of 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. Here's his response. And we'll have to turn to that particular passage, and I'll turn there now and read it. It says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Well, the word sanctify here means just simply this, to set aside. Actually, that is the primary meaning of sanctification. And the sanctified vessels and persons that you have in Scripture are those that are set aside for God's use. Anything that's set aside for God's use is sanctified. Now, what he's saying here is that in a marriage where there's an unbeliever and a believer, that in God's sight, God does not approve of it, why, you'd say then that that marriage was not made by God at all. He had nothing to do with it. I know that there's some believers today who marry an unbeliever and then try to get out of it by saying, well, I married an unbeliever, and in heaven's sight, I never was married. Yes, you were. If on your part, as a Christian, you entered into a marriage, why, you are married to the unsaved. 
Why? Because scripture says that you are set aside, that the unbeliever is set aside, sanctified for marriage. That is, as far as the marriage ceremony is concerned, they were set aside for that. And the reason for it, even in God's sight, is that those children in God's sight will be considered legitimate, you see. This is a very real thing, by the way. And it ought to give some of these believers today something to think about who try to use that as an excuse. I find many today are saying, well, you know, I married an unbeliever, and after all, that marriage is not a real marriage in God's sight. Yes, it is. God says it is. If on your part as a Christian you entered into it, then it is in God's sight a marriage, and that unbeliever set aside either as a husband or a wife as the case might be. Here's a question that comes to us from a listener in Portland, Oregon. She writes, In John 1, verse 29, it mentions the sin of the world. Could you explain what that is? And may I say to you, and I probably ought to turn that. I didn't intend to do that, but I think the only way to do it is to turn that. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Well, when he says that, I don't think he's speaking of any specific sin. I think he's speaking of all sin. And I mean all of it. When Christ died on the cross, died for all sin. And this party asks, could it be the guilt of our old sinful nature? Well, that's included. That's all in the same ball of wax, by the way. Did Jesus take it away? No, he didn't take that old sinful nature away. And if you examine yourself as a believer, you'll find you still have it. And if you say that you don't have any sin, John also says that you deceive yourself. You can't deceive your wife or your husband. You can't deceive your friends either, but you can deceive yourself. Jesus did not take that away in the sense remove it today. And does that explain how babies can get to heaven without believing? No, you've come at this from the wrong route. That is, in my viewpoint and my understanding of Scripture, is that the reason a baby is saved is because Jesus died and for sin and must be a person uh, be in the position of making a decision. And a baby can't make a decision. I think the same thing would apply to an insane person that cannot make a decision. You and I have been given a free will, and we've been asked to believe. Now, you can't ask a little baby to believe. I lost a little baby, and I expect to see her someday. And it's not because she didn't have a sinful nature, because the first thing she did was cry at the top of her voice, and she was born late at night in the hospital, and people were startled when they heard her cry. She had a voice, I tell you, that was something, and she really expressed herself in the brief time she's in this world. But I expect to see her someday because Jesus died. Now, you say, do you have Scripture for that? And I do have Scripture for that. The Lord Jesus said something about not offending the little ones because they're angels are before my Father. Actually, the word there is pneumat, spirit. That means the little ones that die. The Lord Jesus said, they're mine. They already belong to him. And that's the reason you're not to offend those little ones. They're his. And I think until they reach the age of accountability. I believe that's one way God has gotten millions out of China and India is the infant mortality rate is something fierce in those countries. And it's interesting to me, as the advancement of medicine comes, where the little ones are able to live, also the gospel is penetrated. And God never left this matter today of prolonging the life of a little one. That is, today the death rate among infants is not actually great in this country. And it has raised the death rate from what The lifespan was 40 years. Now it's way up 60-something, so that it's because of that. But the Lord has never let that take place except where the gospel is gone, you see, to make a decision. 
And I believe that the little ones are saved, not because of the reason you give, because they have that sinful nature. Let's wrap up our questions with this one from a listener in Birmingham, Alabama. The question is quite lengthy, so we'll hear Dr. McGee read it and then provide his response. I have the following question to ask with regard which covered the most interesting chapter of Numbers, chapters 22 and reached into chapter 23. And if I may quote the Holy Word, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I will say unto thee, that shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning, saddled his ass, and went with the princes of Moab. Now this party goes on to write, Went our most excellent teacher, I think he means when our most excellent instructor, Dr. McGee. I have a feeling that this part is pulling my leg here, but that's all right. As I've said before, I don't mind answering these questions. He went through these passages. He did not seem to delineate the reasons for the Lord's anger. I believe that it was because Balaam had not followed the specific instructions of the Lord in that. Instead of waiting for the man to call him, he apparently voluntarily arose and jumped to the conclusion the Lord would overlook this small discrepancy. In the other wonderful books, when a representative of the Lord veered in the smallest detail of the Lord's commands, quick notice of same fallen. Thus, he really had no permission to go with the princes of Moab, for the Lord would have seen, apparently, that he received no call to go. This, I think, is why immediately an angel stood in the way as an adversary. Well, may I say to this party, you've been very candid with me, and I do not quite agree with this lofty language that you use here, And I totally disagree with your understanding of this passage of Scripture. Now, I could only wish that you had heard us when we went through the book of Numbers and dealt with these two chapters. And at that time, you would find, and I can't go into a great deal of detail, but we can furnish you the tape for this particular section of when we went through it, that it really is, I think you've really missed the entire point. You see, this man Balaam had a love for money. He was a paid prophet, and he was a prophet. I have a message on a prophet for profit, a P-R-O-P-H-E-T for P-R-O-F-I-T. He was a paid preacher who's appealing to the man with the money, the one who can pay him. And we have preachers like that, unfortunately, today. I don't think it's the great sin of the ministry, however, but I do think there are those like that. And Balaam wanted to go, and God granted him permission to go after this man pled with him to go, but told him that he's only to say the message that God gave him. And that's all, by the way, he could deliver, and that's the reason that Balak took him to four different positions to see if he couldn't get him to curse Israel. God wouldn't permit him to do that. If you'd like to know more about the story of Balaam, then you'll want to download a free copy of Dr. McGee's e-booklet called Balaam, A Prophet for Profit. Or maybe you'd find yourself interested in studying other personalities in the Bible, such as David, Daniel, or Jonah. Well, we have two hardback books that you might find helpful. They're titled Real Characters and then More Real Characters. For ordering information on the hardback books, contact one of our service operators Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. The number to call is 1-800-65-BIBLE. That's 1-800-652-4253. To find the free downloads page with all of our PDF e-booklets, go to our website located online at ttb.org and click on Resources. We encourage you to join us this week on the Through the Bible radio program. When you climb aboard the Bible bus, you'll travel through the whole Word of God in five years, book by book and chapter by chapter. 
As we wrap up the final moments of our broadcast, we'd like to remind you to write and let us know that you're enjoying this program and how you've been blessed by it. The address to write is questions and answers for those in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now we pray that God will answer all your questions and solve all your problems. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, me washed in white as snow. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.